So I think we're going to try to get started. Um, this is the session on ethics in the archives. My name is Jeff Warner. Um, I'm going to be the moderator for this afternoon's session. And I'm also the founder of Reveal Digital, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But before we get started with the introductions of our panel, um, a quick word about the structure of our session today. We're going to start with each panelist um, making an opening statement. Uh, this will highlight, through their own experiences, some of the key issues related to ethics and digitization. Uh, we would then like to open the session uh, to you all uh, for questions, invite you to share your own experiences, issues, any best practices uh, as it relates to the digitization of our cultural past. Um, just a bit about Reveal. Um, we are, as of last February, the newest member of the Ithaca JSTOR family. Um, we use a library crowdfunded model to create uh, curated and aggregated open access digital collections. Uh, to date, most of our projects have centered on 20th century social movements, uh, both from the far left as well as from the far right. Our first project was an open access collection on the alternative press from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, it's finished now. Um, it's about 700 titles uh, openly available to all. So um, if you're not familiar with it, please check it out. It's voices.revealdigital.org. Uh, if it's not on your A to Z list of uh, resources, it probably should be. Um, our second project dates back to the 1920s, and it examines the rise of white nationalism um, and the press, and it's embodied primarily by the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, um, and their establishment of a newspaper publishing empire that helped grow their membership and promote their political and social agenda. But the project also covers the main voices of the set. Uh, those newspapers published by the Catholic Church, uh, Jewish press, uh, African American publications, and even mainstream newspapers that together waged a successful campaign to counter the client's message. Our third project, which is under development, looks at student activism in the 20th century America, and it will chronicle student led protests from the lunch counter sit ins at Greensboro, North Carolina, which sparked the birth of SNCC and the student involvement in the civil rights movement to the occupation of the sacred ground of Alcatraz Island by student-led Native Americans, to nine years of student activism on campus at UCLA. Now, all of our projects are the result of the generous support of our funding libraries, and we work with them and their special collections and institutional archives as sources for our digitization. Our collections, by design, deal with content that sits outside the mainstream and the result can raise ethical issues associated with the nature of the content as well as the openness of our collections. We are striving to build them in a thoughtful and sensitive manner in that regard. I'm looking forward to today's discussion and learning from our experiences. So now on to the panel. Um, our first panelist is Rebecca Hankins. She's a tenured professor and certified artist and librarian responsible for building collections related to Africana and women's and gender studies at Texas A&M University. Her previous employment included 12 years as a senior archivist at the Amistad Research Center at Tulane University in New Orleans. In December of 2016, President Obama appointed her to a three-year position with the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, the funding arm for the National Archives. Rebecca was elected to SAA Council, serving from 2006 to 2009. She was also elected as an SAA uh, Distinguished Fellow in 2016. In that same year, she was appointed as Wendler Endowed Professor at Texas A&M. She has presented widely on the subjects of diversity, inclusion, cultural competency, social justice, and equity in academia. Her publishing work has featured in science fiction, library, archival, and other peer-reviewed journals and books. And in 2016, her book, uh, co-authored with Miguel Juarez, 
was published uh, by Library Juice Press entitled, Where Are All the Libraries of Color? The Experiences of People of Color in Academia. Our second panelist is Melissa Stoner, who grew up in uh, Shiprock, Shiprock, New Mexico, on the Navajo Reservation. Her first job was at a public library in Farmington, New Mexico. And she started as a computer lab assistant and then moved on to reference assistant working with librarians. Melissa is now the Native American Studies Librarian at the Ethnic Studies Library at the University of California, Berkeley. With a specialization in digital archives and collections, Melissa is currently coordinating the creation of the library's digital lab. As part of that, Melissa worked on digitizing uh, UC Berkeley's Third World Liberation Front collection, a social movement that helped establish ethnic studies as an interdisciplinary field of study. By starting this lab, Melissa's goal is to make resources more accessible to the communities they serve. She also believes it's important to consider each piece individually in the digitization process. And that's especially important to her as a member of Cal's Native American Graves Protection and Reparation Act Advisory Committee. And this is the body that oversees the efforts to return Native American remains and cultural artifacts to their tribes of origin. And lastly, uh, Ty Jones uh, is a Herbert H. Lehman Curator for American History at Columbia University. Ty's interests include radical social movements, New York City history, and environmental history in the United States. He is author of two books, the latest, More Powerful Than Dynamite, Radicals, Plutocrats, Progressives, and New York's Year of An Anarchy, Rediscovers a Forgotten Political Crisis in the World New York City in the Early 20th Century. His first book, A Radical Line, From the Labor Movement to the Weather on the Ground, one family's century of conscience, explored his own family's long history of political dissent against the backdrop of 20th century social movements. Ty is currently working on a third book, Boomtown, a history of labor and environment in the progressive era of gold mining communities. Before becoming a layman curator, Ty was an assistant professor of history at the Bard College Master of Arts and teaching program. He was formerly a reporter for Newsday. His writings have appeared in a variety of national publications, ranging from the New York Times to The Nation to the Occupied Wall Street Journal. Unfortunately, our fourth scheduled panelist, Chelsea Juliet Rowell, uh, who is a team lead for digital scholarship at Tufts University, is not able to join us today for unforeseen circumstances. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to well, let's go with Rebecca, since she's got slides. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. This is my first time here. Uh, but I'm hoping that this won't be my last. So um, when Jeff asked me about this, we had talked about the digitization of the yearbooks at Texas A&M. And so what you'll see in my presentation is some images from the yearbook, yearbooks and some images that I thought match up with what we are educating our students about, this history that they didn't know about in many instances, and also in terms of the university as a whole, uh, making sure that they are aware of some of these things that are in the archives in spite of the fact that they um, pretty much want to ignore them. So uh, this first image is a very um, controversial image, uh, uh, not, not image, but individual. Um, 
Sullivan, Lawrence Sullivan Ross is sort of like the patron saint of Texas A&M. And there is a statue of Ross on the campus. Um, but I paired it up with this image from the yearbook because in many instances, this is what we are facing in dealing with trying to uh, educate people about this, uh, the problems of these statues and this history. So this particular image is in one of our yearbooks. It's the Veterans of Lost Cause. And of course, this is that Confederate myth, uh, that lost cause myth that has been um, put out. And in terms of Ross, uh, who was a Confederate general, they tend to want to use that lost cause mindset uh, when dealing with um, Sullivan Ross, who they call Sullivan. And that's that whole notion that um, the South was lost because of the, uh, of the um, war of, uh, what do they call it, uh, that it's, it's uh, uh, the, yes, <laughs> and that the um, myth of the chivalry and valor of Confederates fighting for their homeland, not slavery. And so it's this whole um, myth, myth, mythology that ignores who Ross is. And so when we decided to digitize our yearbooks, um, we met and we talked about, you know, should we put out a disclaimer? Should we have something at the beginning? And uh, as librarians and, and archivists, we said, no, we don't want to say that this is something that you should know about or that we are trying to tell you how to think about it. But we did include something where we uh, thought it was important to oops, note that um, this that, that we, we're offering this public access and including historical materials that may contain offensive language and negative stereotypes. So we did include that. And we did talk to, and whenever I teach about some of this stuff, I do tell my, the students that, that a lot of the material that you may see in these yearbooks has really ugly language. Um, I don't want to hear you say those ugly words, but it is in there and it's important to have an accurate uh, telling of this history. And so um, these are some other individuals that are in the yearbooks, but I try to pair it up with information that they need to know. So in this case, um, Cabot is a former, well, he was the um, president of the board of directors in the 1890s. And this is the Klan robe of the Cabot. We're not sure if it's his, but it's came from his um, home. And we do know that when he died, um, the Klan sent his, him uh, a wreath with KKK on. So this is something I, I try to inform our students, let them know that these things have some con context to them. This individual is very, very uh, well known throughout the campus. Um, Dana X. Bible. Bible was a coach, um, the coach who really is revered on campus. And I always tell students that's his clan robe. It has his name in it. It is embroidered in his name. So I'm trying to give them an understanding that these individuals are not just who we think they are. And this is other material from our yearbooks. Um, so this individual is called Uncle Dan. And uh, if you'll notice, there's pretty um, 
really uh, problematic language that the students talk about this individual. There is a section over here where, where they call him co-laborer with mules and talking about um, how he's this gold old slavery named Darkey. So these are things that the students need to be aware of when they are looking at these individuals. Um, and yes, they are pretty shocked by some of the stuff that they see. Um, so I point this out to them too. So in the 1906, 1905-1906 yearbook, there was a German club called the KKs. And, and uh, that's, um, the, this, this group was um, called the, the, the Kraut, the Catalanic Kraut Club, which is, uh, makes sense. These were German. Uh, um, there were a number of German organizations. But this is the KKKs, and if you look closely, they started out with this wingless angels to the KKK, and if you look at the membership of both of these groups, they were the same members. The individual who was head of the KKs, the German group, was the head of this group too. And we know that they have modeled this on the plan because they talk about it later. And I thought I'd show some of the other materials in our yearbooks. Black Faces Humor. This is from the 50s and they use uh, this blackface ball in order to raise money for various organizations. And this is also something that's from our newspapers and it talks about Bryan College, Bryan, which is part of, of uh, the Air Bryan and College Nations are, are super <coughs> cities. And so there are um, pictures that we have of various parades that were going on by the Klan in um, not just Bryan, but also in Waco, in Houston, in Austin. So uh, the Klan was very popular. We have a lot of documentation on uh, the Klan. So uh, all of these things I bring to the students to make sure that they're aware, that they're not looking at these things as individual um, particular uh, issues within you know, one or two of our yearbooks, that they have context that there is consequences for a lot of the uh, individuals who were involved in these particular things. And I, I ended with this. This is in Houston, and I, it's still in Houston to this day, and a, a number of the students are still not aware. Texas has tons of these statues still all over uh, um, the, the city and the state, but I think it's interesting because one of the things the students always ask me is were there women involved? And we have actual um, photographs of women uh, in their clan robes being a baptizing uh, session or some other activity. And if you look here, I know it's not clear, this monument committee was all women. And we do know that the daughters of the Confederacy were really responsible for a number of these statues. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much.
Yate Cheyamal is a stoner in a chef who was on initially. Don't touch your English is she? Didn't have on initially. Hello, good morning. My name is Melissa Stoner. Um, before I get started though with my talk, I would just like to take a moment to recognize and respectfully acknowledge that Charleston is built on the ancestral land of the Kusa people, um, and they are the original stewards of this land. So I'm going to talk to you today. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm just going to tell you a story about what happens when items um, that are considered culturally sensitive get digitized when they should not have been. <laughs> and some of the lessons learned from that. So in 2017, well, I would say probably a couple of years before that, um, a lot of researchers uh, work with the local California Indian tribes. So I'm from UC Berkeley, our ethnic studies library. But around 2016, late 2015, um, there was a class that was researching um, water in the West and working with tribes. And one of the students had come across some ethnographic documents online that were digitized um, by the Bancroft, Bancroft Library. And so the student decided to notify the tribal members as a way to say, hey, look, you know, you come to the Bancroft, you travel all this way to um, look at these documents when you can just look at them online. Upon further um, investigation and looking at the documents online, tribal members started to notice that there was uh, one culturally sensitive information and also um, information that was sensitive in terms of like location and what what was in these ethnographic documents that they involved the uh, the TIPO. So the TIPO is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. And a letter was written to, well, actually an email was sent to uh, the Maycroft and asking for a takedown. And what kind of stemmed from that was the, the documents were pulled, um, I would say, within 24 hours of that. Um, so that's the good news. <laughs> and what stemmed from that was there needed to be more conversation between UC Berkeley administration and the California Indian tribes. And they decided in 2017 to have a California Indian tribal forum. Um, over 50 tribes were invited. Uh, about 70 representatives and individuals from tribes also attended the forum, and that included tribal archivists, librarians, um, museum curators. One of the results of the tribal forum, so the tribal forum lasted two days, and the report produced was, a report was produced and presented to the chancellor. Um, the tribes had agreed during that time that the report would not be shared with the general public. Um, around March of 2018, there was a memo that was announced, and I think this is what really stemmed from the digitization of those items, kind of also extended into how UC Berkeley was um, handling the remains of those tribes' ancestors. So um, the memo from the chancellor was that there would be a change in the campus micro policy. Um, the vice chancellor of research, Randy Katz, would appoint the working group, a working group, to discuss and make recommendations on collections that are not necessarily micro sensitive. So that would include ethnographic documents, manuscripts, photographs. Um, and out of that came the Native American Collections and Archives, Libraries, and Museums at UC Berkeley Working Group. That's a really long name. <laughs> you couldn't find it, I couldn't. <laughs> so um, I co-chaired that with Andrew Garrett. Um, the members of the committee were Susan Edwards, Jeffrey Mackey Mason, um, Nicole myers Lim, Benjamin Porter, and Elaine Tennant, and also Werner Bowie was there to help facilitate that. So we, upon putting our heads together and figuring out how are we going to um, take a look at all of the collections that are on campus, and not just within the Bancroft, that we also started to talk about the relationships among indigenous peoples, 
um, between the state university and also look at the ethical and moral considerations that emerge from the history of Berkeley's research and um, the ethics and the curation um, when it comes to collaborating with tribes. Um, from that from that working group report, uh, there were recommendations that were one to basically have the university acknowledge that there there was Native American historical trauma, have them acknowledge that history, acknowledging different systems of information management, improve the campus climate for Native Americans, improve the NAGPRA climate um, to clarify research policy for Native American contexts. Uh, to appoint a central campus tribal liaison who would actually oversee not just the Bancroft's collections but the collections across campus um, to improve accessibility, to digitize, um, and to digitize and basically not digitize Native American materials in campus, archives, and libraries and also to empower Native American individuals, communities, and tribes to participate in curation and assert cultural ownership of materials um, in, in the campus, on the campus. Um, part of the implementation, specifically around um, access, was the development of a takedown policy. Um, usually when I work with tribes, over the summer in a museum studies institute and usually it's really amazing to find out that there are a lot of institutions that don't have a transparent takedown policy especially when working with um, communities of color or indigenous communities um, and part of part of the takedown policy that group that i was in at uc berkeley um, we developed a risk assessment and we also there was a develop of a co-curation workflows um, we also looked at other institutions like the American Philosophical Society we took um, we used a lot of the recommendations from the SAA protocols uh, for Native American archival materials um, which were actually just recently um, adopted by SAA in terms of the museums and their NAGPRA policies, uh, we, the UC Berkeley NAGPRA Advisory Committee um, has been reconstituted because before there were no term limits. Now there are term limits for all of the um, members that are on the committee. And half of the committee members um, are from Native American or Canadian First Peoples. Um, and they also, yeah, so there, there are term limits that were set. Um, I do have a copy, there is a copy of the report that's up on the Vice Chancellor Research, Research's uh, website. I'm happy to give you that link um, after, after the talk, and I usually just um, invite people to come and read the report and comment on it, um, because that report and those comments are actually what are driving the Chancellor at this point to hire more data staff. Um, focus on ethics and access around those materials that are not necessarily related to NICRA. And yes. thank you. about the classroom before we start to talk about uh, the archives um, as a digital platform. So I lead many uh, archival research workshops over the course of the year, uh, as I'm sure many people here do as well. And um, you know, I always make sure to uh, include in that introduction to archives uh, some element of the story of the uh, histories of um, racism and bias that are uh, involved in the history of archives and archiving and libraries. Um, then usually I will do a hands-on workshop where students will each have the opportunity to uh, explore one of the collections that are relative to their research topics. So they'll spend 15 minutes looking through a box um, in a classroom, and for many of them this will be the first time they've ever looked at archives in their original format. So a lot of the value here is really just having that experience. 
and then at the end there will be just a brief uh, share out where everyone will talk about what they discovered. Um, so recently, I think that she was uh, right at the start of this past semester, uh, one of the students had asked for archives related uh, actually to uh, Native American uh, tribal governments. And um, you know, looking through our archives portal, I found a collection from a mid 20th century anthropologist, a professor at Columbia. Um, brought that box into class, and um, she was exploring it. And at the end of this session, when everyone was going around, um, she said, uh, this collection made me too angry to even look at. Uh, I had to close the box, and I couldn't even stand to look at it. And I was struck by uh, how appropriate that was, and also uh, how productive it could be uh, in a longer research scenario. Um, and I also felt that because this session had really um, described these histories of injustice, I like to think that that student was sort of primed to uh, kind of express their reaction, and, and maybe they would have anyway. Um, so I want to hold on to that idea of that anger or that uh, sorrow, that emotion, you know, any of the many ways people can uh, feel about archives. Um, so I don't think Jeff mentioned this, but I am actually on the editorial board of uh, Reveal Digital. And, um, you know, Reveal Digital is in my experience, a you know a small I and mean, I think it's really Jeff and and Peggy and um, a small organization that has made uh, a really outsized impact. And you know, as someone who um, meets with students all the time and, and directs uh, thesis research, uh, you know, I've used and recommended independent voices project um, you know more times than I can remember. Does anyone use independent voices? Does anyone? Yeah, it's, I mean, it really is the single best that I know of access point to um, you know, anti-war, uh, black power, gay rights, feminist, and lesbian uh, newspaper groups and magazines from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It replaces a microfilm version, which I also remember using um, 10, 20 years ago. Um, and so, uh, you know, reveal as a as a, an independent um, sort of archival digitization shop that does these projects that are based around themes that can include collections from multiple universities uh, and has open access as its end goal uh, is a very I think probably everyone here would agree that that sounds like a really important uh, niche that someone uh, like reveal should fill. Um, and nevertheless, every time I talk about reveal in public, everyone gets very angry <laughs> about it. You know, so so what I really want to talk about today is some of the debates that these digitization efforts have actually spawned. And um, you know, I think we're here largely because of this blog post that Chelsea, uh, Raoul, and Taryn Kutsi uh, wrote in January. Uh, for the website Lady Science called The Archive of Hate, Ethics of Care and the Preservation of Ugly Histories, which was about this KKK digitization effort and sparked a really, uh, I think, important conversation. Um, and yet that was really just the most recent of several different debates that I'm, that I'm aware of uh, around these efforts. Um, and I'm sure there have, been, there have been more. So I'm going to quote a little bit from the blog post. Um, they write, uh, historically, librarians have privileged an ethic of access as a foundation of democratic civil society. Without unfettered access to ideas, the thinking goes, citizens are ill-equipped for civic engagement. <coughs> Intrinsic to this ethic of access is the principle of neutrality. A neutral library does not adopt any political stances, providing free and open access to all content. Um, and then they write, uh, guided by an ethic of care, we can only responsibly provide access to white supremacist cultural heritage by building with, not for, people of color. The KKK newspaper collection should never have left the drawing board without inviting anti-racist activists, critical race theorists, historians of race, and librarians of color to the table. Together with revealed digital staff and editorial board members, they should have been there to grapple with whether and how this content would be made available online. So, um, 
for those who haven't seen it, the, the main uh, gist of the critique was about um, you know, the idea in the first place to provide more access to white nationalist uh, literature. Um, the potential risk of having these uh, documents available to all, uh, with the idea being that, that, that these sources from the 1920s do actually be used by white nationalists today as a source of ideas and inspiration. And then as I read, there was a, um, a critique about reveal and the board and, uh, and the decision-making process about how we came to this decision. Um, and then finally, um, there's a suggestion that, um, and, and kind of like Rebecca was saying, how do you, could you present these materials in such a way that they were contextualized or they uh, had some learning modules or some other um, kind of resources available to um, just make sure people were not receiving these without any uh, mediation. And actually, Rebecca can't pause and ask you a question, which is, um, so on the digital site, you said that there was no statement about the politics of the um, of the yearbooks. So it was in the classroom context that you were able to show them the... Oh, I, I, I definitely... So, so I think it was important to get it out there. And there's a lot of myths that go on throughout Texas A&M. And one of the myths is that we don't have plans. And I, I, and I felt it was really important that the students see that along with these three books that memorialize all of these problematic people, there are materials we have that contextualize the are. And so yeah, we, we did know that there were problematic images in there, but uh, it, it, it is an issue. But I, you know, as an archivist, I really do feel it's important to be out there uh, because there are these myths that grow up around the, the lost cause. But those are tons of myths. And I've had students, especially in Texas, you know, Texas here. Uh, I mean, Texas history books are really problematic. But this, this whole notion of this war of northern aggression is in the books. And nothing about slavery has been called the Confederacy, which is a real problem. So, Ross, they don't acknowledge that part of its history. Okay, so I think, if I'm hearing you correctly, I, uh, there, there's, there's clearly, from your perspective, a value in um, you know, confronting students with these uh, objects in archives and presenting them and confronting them uh, and not kind of hiding them. And, and you know, as with the, the, this blog post about this archive with the um, Hate in America project, there was a sense that the historical importance of these periodicals was clear. Uh, and, and then the rest of the conversation was about kind of whether this was a way to use a sort of a limited digitization budget and also if they were going to be presented, how um, they'd be best presented. And um, I'll mention a couple other incidents in less detail. Um, there was a conversation a few years ago about one of the uh, magazines in the Independent Voices um, archive called On Our Backs, which was a, a feminist erotica magazine from the 80s, which was sort of an ironic response to Off Our Backs, which was a very famous feminist magazine. And um, On Our Backs was included in the Independent Voices project, and um, there was a sense that there were people who had agreed, uh, in some cases they had not even agreed to have their photos in that magazine, who would never have wanted to have images uh, on the internet. Um, so there's a question here of sort of formats changing from an you know, extremely limited run magazine to uh, global access. Um, and Jeff can speak more to this, but, but Honor Bites has been taken down. Um, so people, I think, requested it to be taken down, and then it was taken down, either a direct response or, or for other reasons. Uh, Are you aware they presented in ALA um, I'm not aware. What, what, what can you say about uh, On our backs, it was one of the, the only overtly sex-positive <coughs> that occurred in 
that they came and presented and how they really liked pornography because it helped their sex life. And when this was back in the 80s when they presented, or this is more? I don't remember which act is the company, but it should be hard to find. Okay. Yeah. Right. So in other words, they had a public presence, but of course that was not everyone who was in the fall of the magazine. And that's even that is different from me having photos from 35 years earlier available online. I've also heard in uh, sort of discussions like this, uh, a critique from other uh, feminist authors who feel that their work has been uh, just constantly co-opted and anonymized over the years. And so whereas the sort of reveal vision is that sort of more access and wider access is always a positive, and maybe that's not fair, Jeff, maybe you can respond to that, but clearly is rooted in a sense that, that access is, is crucial. There actually was a whole part of that audience that felt that they wanted to restrict access to maintain control of their work and their whole, you know, a major part of their experience for decades had been having other people take their work, not give them credit, uh, and they were responding to that. Um, so that's, those are some examples that I think are interesting, and it seems to me that these are all resulting from this moment when uh, these types of sources are being digitized. This is explicitly a problem of uh, digitization and sort of broader access. And, um, you know, there are, if you spend time on the uh, Library of Congress digitized newspaper site, for instance, which goes up to 1923, you know, there's an enormous amount of hate speech and white nationalist writings in those newspapers. So it's not that there is um, there are, there's no access to those sources, um, uh, but it does, I think the questions of how uh, how these decisions are made is really important and also, um, you know, how, how do we create a, a takedown policy that doesn't put the burden on the people who are themselves kind of suffering the consequences of these choices? And, um, you know, it's one thing for documents from the 1980s, but, um, you know, things are archives from the 19th century where there's really no constituency, except in a case like uh, what Melissa was talking about, where there would be sort of a, a group of descendants who would have um, a stake in, in talking about archival treatment of ancestors' papers. Um, you know, who is making decisions about archives that are you know, outside of the realm of copyright but still present ethical issues? So in Columbia, we're considering an archive of, um, kind of inmates, records from what was called an asylum of the 1890s, which was really, you know, hundreds of women, uh, mostly women of color, who were uh, incarcerated by their families for uh, not kind of conforming to social norms of the time. And this archive has photos and it has files, and it's, you know, it's clearly beyond any legal um, issue, but it raises these ethical questions, even though we're not thinking about digitizing it. Um, for the you know, for the insane science. So you have something like that that you digitize. Digitize all of the digitize the archives that are digitized all of the all of the ones from the eighteen hundreds. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's a conversation I mean it's a conversation. And so um, I also I'll just end by saying, you know, this is I wonder if this is also part of a, a larger conversation about archives and access and open access. Um, and, um, you know, I'm not going to speak too much about this. I'm certainly not an expert, but my understanding is, um, you know, one of the conversations around archives related to the Black Lives Matter movement is about providing access to community members, but not necessarily to scholars and outsiders. And I, I feel like that conversation is happening also with indigenous archives to some degree. Um, so the sense of archives and more access to archives as an obvious benefit to all is, is I think, no longer tenable. And yet, to return to that opening anecdote, um, you know, clearly, or maybe not clearly, I think these are all open questions, but I guess my sense would be that um, you know, that student sh maybe should not have been shielded from that archive, I'm not sure, but uh, you know, the experience of uh, confronting the ideas of a previous generation of scholarship seemed like a productive uh, confrontation and 
you know, could play out over the course of a years through the research into a formative experience. And so um, there's clearly broader ethical questions here. There's also a specific question of um, the, the new development of uh, digitization of archives and periodicals for a mass audience. And so I think we're here today to hear your thoughts about any of those questions. So I will cede the floor. Thank you. So we have kind of a small room. Um, any questions, comments, practices that you're, that you're using today? Issues that you're facing on your campuses that you want to talk about? Um, I'm not sure about that question, but we're digitizing um, a photographic studio uh, after here in Charleston. And there are maybe photographer photographs um, and burials. So in our collection, we have dead uh, people in caskets. And um, we're digitizing them because the, the, the negatives are in poor condition. But we're also considering and probably will put them online with the down notice that you know, our descendant um, is uh, unnerved or offended by their ancestors uh, in a public way. Um, before I digitize them, or well, I did look at other collections similar, and other repositories have digitized them online. I have a question for the panel. Do you think we should unsanitize history? I've been amazed at times to learn things that have really surprised me, such as the depth of segregation in the North. And we understood at least, and I think, that there were bad things in Texas, but I'm not sure that we understand how bad things also were in other parts of the country where people feel a lot more innocent about their ancestors than they should be. Uh, I, I will say, um, I think it's important. There does need to be some sensitivity around digitizing um, materials. Um, it's, it's a delicate balance in many ways. And I do think, I mean, this whole notion that the North um, had dealt with their demons is not actually true. <laughs> uh, there's a recent publication that looks at uh, how a lot of the things that uh, happened in the North were tested in the South because they um, there was uh, a more acceptance of, of oppression and fall. But a lot of those ideas came from the North. A lot of those things were, were uh, implemented in the North and then uh, uh, were, were also used in the South. So I definitely think that there needs to be more um, people looking at uh, some of some of the issues that uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates talks about in the, the case for reparations about housing. A lot of those ideas started in the North, and we need to have the documentation so that people are aware that, you know, you can't demonize the South without first looking at the North and how a lot of those policies were implemented in the North and also uh, filtered the South. So I think that there definitely needs to be more individuals who are looking at those issues. And, and, and our products have that kind of protection. Um, whether or not it should be digitized, <coughs> um, I think uh, it, it, it's, it's important to provide access. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm more of an access person, to be honest. I know things should be preserved. I think you definitely have to be aware of people's feelings about things, but I'm, I'm more for uh, putting it out there. I, 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 uh, I want to respond to the question about the 
these types of issues as fringe issues or, or uh, niche issues, you know, or um, exceptions, you know, when students come across it, they, they can't believe it, they never heard about it. So how do we shift um, our understanding as a field, as librarians and archivists, that this is actually not exceptional, that this is the vast majority, it's only been decades, you know, that we've been trying to grapple with this as a society, you know, in a, in a different way. So the vast majority of our history is of colonialism. So, so how, do you, how do you do it in your work with students in terms of shifting that narrative? I hope that was clear. <laughs> Well, for me, I, I think it is very important. Um, so one of the areas that I was very intentional about uh, building in my collection are the movements of radical groups, uh, student movements, uh, black uh, associates, uh, black um, uh, <laughs> uh, socialists and black communists. I've, I've been very particular about getting the rec uh, getting documentation of movements that were not uh, the, the civil rights that most people know about. Looking at uh, groups like the Black Panthers, the, the uh, some of the other, you know. Radical groups that were out there. Yeah. Um, I hate to use that term. <laughs> so radical to me is that they are pushing against the um, prevailing winds. And so it's important for me that when I talk to classes, that yes, we have documentation of enslaved people. We have materials on the clan and clan activities. But I want them to also understand that there were groups that were fighting against this. And that one of the issues that I'm constantly battling with uh, people uh, of Texas A&M, they, they want to rehabilitate Saul, Saul Ross's character. And I'm saying to them that he was a Confederate general. He joined <laughs> the Confederacy as a, he was not a conscripted soldier, and he rose up to the ranks through his battles, uh, killing, <laughs> and that confederate, the Confederacy was built. So, so I talked to them about that, but I also want them to understand that there were groups that were fighting against that, that people were not passive. That, that it wasn't everybody was doing this, so that's why he was a Confederate that, that it was something about the South, that you know he was just like everyone else. And so I, I want to continually dispel that to my students. And so it's important for me to show them also that there were these other individuals who were actively so that's how I you know, talk about it in context. And I do think it's only I'm only one person doing this and trying to get others to uh, to do this kind of work, especially when you have things like your girls and black and all of the other stuff. It, it's really hard. Um, I, I I've talked to classes. I talk to my colleagues constantly about when you talk about the past, when you talk about science, they always say, oh no, well let's settle, you know, the STEM, you can't add anything in there uh, about uh, people of color. So you can't. <laughs> you know, so it's, 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 it's trying to push the narrative away from that. We were only this or that. Um, so that's that's what I do. We have just another minute. Uh, any other responses from the panel? Uh, yeah. I mean, how do you, in your work with researchers or students, push the narrative that issues around racism or um, sexism or oppression are? 
fringe issues and make them more central to the issue. Does that make sense? Yes. We work together too. So we'll just together. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think whenever, whenever researchers and students, it's really a, a lot of bringing these topics um, up, up front. Um, fortunately, I do work with a lot of study students and a lot of studies um, researchers who are um, who are really in researching these topics in depth. Um, I also think in order to really understand the history of, of a place is to go, is to work with communities um, in, in, that, in the areas that you're in. I feel like as a librarian working at an institution that we are all in a position of privilege to empower the communities to be stored in their own collections. And I think through that, with their voices, they're able to um, bring those issues up front, bring what's important to them to the I want to thank the panel. I want to thank you for.